Hello, my name is Cliff Roop, and welcome to the EPEW session, Building Relationships Through Games. I am very excited to be here. Uh, I've longed to attend EPEW uh, in person, uh, and I'm hoping that I get to do that at some point in the future, but this is a wonderful opportunity to connect with all of you in this way, and welcome to all of the other people attending today. It's been great to be learning alongside all of you from these wonderful people and educators. A quick word before we jump in. Much, if not all, of what we cover today works best if you already have begun to build or have been building relationships with your students. I'm so convinced of this. I've changed the way that I start and maintain my curriculum planning and teaching. We begin each year learning and understanding what a community is and how we are each a part of several. We also investigate what qualities make for great teammates or members of our communities. The word teammate strongly states that we are in this together for a common purpose. Now, none of us are an exception to this. We are all in community with one another. Yes, it looks completely different today than it did several months ago. But what has not changed is we are still all part of one community, and we are also part of several communities where we live and work. How can we teach our students anything we are not modeling ourselves? Perhaps you feel you can't build relationships with your students because you have way too many. At least reach out to whom you can. Take whatever chances you have to learn about them. It could happen in a class or during lunch or recess when I was single, I had time to go to their sporting or recital events. These days, I'm blessed to monitor recess and lunch, so I have conversations with them on more personal levels as often as I can. Regardless of what your teaching situation is, please take time to reach out to the students you can and try to build relationships with them. Okay, moving on. So games provide a lot of opportunity for our students to learn so many different things. And these games, I've always felt, are like seeds. They contain these clear learning objectives, but yet also packed with inside these games are chances to practice skills, uh, not just for the games themselves, but for skills beyond the game and beyond the physical. And that's what I love about our profession so much is that we have opportunity every single day to teach the kids not just the physical skills, but to go way beyond the physical and teach them skills that are for their life. And education, while it's an important stop in a student's life, it is indeed just that. It is a stop. Their life is way out there beyond uh, waiting for them and even in right now. And so we have a chance to teach them things that can enhance uh, their lives, uh, their relationships with each other. And that's what I've been discovering and learning while playing games in our physical education classes. And I'd like to just tell you a quick story about how that came to be. And then we're going to jump right into some of the activities that we do. And it all started with Builders and Blasters. I had used this activity several times as a quick warm-up. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with it, it is a game where you have uh, one set of students is going to be tipping over cones while the other set of students is going to be standing them back up. And so it's for 60 seconds, running clock or whatever time you desire, uh, just to have those kids running around and their hearts are pumping and their bodies are warmed up and ready to go for the next activity. But in this game, the kids uh, would be running around, half of them building and the other half blasting. And if there's if they're anything at all like my students, they were not just tipping the cone over, they were blasting it for real and knocking it 30 feet away and having a great time doing it. But uh, we were going to be doing a speed stacking unit and I decided to use speed stacks for the, the activity as well. And I don't know if I saw it in speed stacks curriculum yet or not, this was a, a few years ago, but I know that they have it now. So I had one half up stacking the 333. I wanted to keep it simple and quick so that the kids could move on to the next one. Then the other half would down stack the 333. And as I was watching them do this, I started noticing how the kids were responding and reacting with one another in the game. And I decided that we would have some conversations about it. And uh, some other questions started to form in my mind as I watched them 
uh, participate in the activity this time. And uh, it was going to be interesting to see where it would go. So we all cleaned up after the activity, and I'd had them sit down in our circle. And so then I started asking a pretty easy question for them. I just asked them, so what was more fun, uh, down stacking or up stacking? Pretty much everybody shared what they thought was most fun. And then I decided to ask them a different question. I decided to ask one a little more technical maybe. I asked them what was easier to do? What was easier? Was it easier to up stack the cups or down stack the cups? And this time the answers were a little bit more lopsided. Uh, most of the kids would say that down stacking was just easier. And a few would raise their hand and say that up stacking was easier. And I thought that was curious, knowing what I know about the down stacking and how we've seen kids do it before. But I wanted to hear what they had to say. And the kids who thought up stacking was easier, uh, they thought so because they enjoyed it more. And so it made it easier for them. They were the kinds of kids who rather would like to rise to a challenge or be challenged and not take the easy way out. And knowing these kids as I did, I could tell that they were being honest about that. And that's just how they did everything. Uh, they didn't want anything to be easy. They wanted it all to be a challenge and they wanted to work for it. So as I started asking them, what, why was it easier to downstack? Uh, the kids who were raising their hands for easier, they would say things like, it was just quicker. Uh, you don't have to think about it. Uh, it's, just, it's just easy to do. And then you can just go to the next one. You just down stack, run to the next stack, down stack, run to the next stack. So then I decided to ask them this next question. What's easier, hurting someone's feelings or saying kind things to them? They were not expecting that kind of question. And I could see why. But you could tell that a lot of kids were starting to think about it. So hands would start to go up. And the common response was, it's just easier to hurt someone's feelings. And I was so proud of my kids at that moment because you could see it in their eyes. They were really, really thinking about this one. They didn't, they weren't, I mean, it was uncomfortable for sure, but they were ready to be honest and answer this question. So I followed up with, why is it easier to hurt someone's feelings? And it was really, really interesting to see the responses, they were very similar and sometimes almost exact in describing how down stacking the cups was easier. It's just easier. It just happens. It, it's fast. I don't have to think about it. Insult someone and move on to the next person. And regardless of the reasons why they would say hurtful things to each other, uh, sometimes they're hurting themselves and sometimes they want to make themselves feel better than other people. So that's just the way that it happens. If you think about it, for you and for me, and for every anyone for that matter, it's just easier. Hurtful things come out of us so fast. And for a lot of us, it takes a lot of effort to stop and not be negative and think about something positive that's happening. And then share that with someone or look for the positive in another person. We just know that it's easier to be critical and to be negative and to be down. And so then that gave us an opportunity to ask the next question of why is it so hard to be positive and encouraging? I followed up with a question I wasn't sure I was going to get any answers to. I asked them if they, would just, if they wanted to share times that they'd been discouraging to somebody. And several kids raised their hands. And you could see it wasn't a contest to see who could be, you know, the best at, you know, being the worst. You know, they were really, you could see it in their eyes. And, and a couple of kids were close to tears. And it was really, I about lost it myself to see the honesty in their eyes and hear it from their hearts. You could tell that they were kind of busted up about not being kind and how being confronted with the fact that, you know, it's just, it's just too easy to hurt people's feelings. And it's not a skill that I really want to have. And a couple of kids had even told me that day that they were going to go make things right with these other kids. And I know that they did because I saw them do it later on. And it was a wonderful thing to see. I was so proud of them. It was so nice. But as we closed that class, we followed up with the, with the talk about the power of our words. Uh, there's a quote that uh, I came across, and it was, just, <laughs> it was still the most powerful thing that I've seen in a long time. It says, Raise your words and not your voice. It is rain that grows the flowers, not thunder. 
So our words have so much power. And after this experience, I began to notice other ways that we would we could learn about how to relate with one another in positive and powerful ways through the other activities that we already do. And it also lit a fire inside me to go look for more things that could be tools to help our kids learn how to relate to one another in positive and powerful ways. And then also how to even fix when we've gone wrong. This session has a few of those examples. And again, I'm grateful for all of you who have been here to learn along with me. Okay, so for this part, I got my glasses on because I'm old. All right, so one of the first things that I, I recognized is that kids need uh, help understanding how they feel and sometimes why they feel the way they do and why they even react or respond in certain ways when they feel certain things. So one of the activities that we've done is another tried and true uh, classic uh, called Emotion Motion from Spark. And you'll notice I have the questions here as well. Um, you can have them go through all of these different uh, activities. Uh, and I've started this with uh, kindergartners, and I've also used it with uh, first and second, and sometimes come back to it a little bit with the older kids um, when I feel like we need a little refresher. Uh, but the, uh, the activity is called Emotion Motion, and basically in, inside any square, as you can see there, any space, uh, you just start reading. You could read a sentence. You could do it that way. Uh, like I said, I'm a a big fan of storytelling and uh, um, just creating word pictures, uh, just to, stories for kids to 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 interact inside. I just feel like it brings out a whole lot more uh, natural movement and emotion from them. Uh, so, you know, you could read a sentence, um, like it says here, you know, the sun is shining and you're on your way to a birthday party. How does this make you want to move? And then, you know, you, the kids start walking around however they, however they would feel at that point. And uh, your friends leave you out of a game. You're sad. What does a sad movement look like? You know, and so then, you know, they're walking around as if they're sad. And obviously the younger kids will have an easier time doing this because uh, they're not hung up on what they look like so much yet. Um, and you can create your own. And then, uh, you know, you, how do you feel when you are happy? How do you move when you're happy? How do you move when you're sad? Uh, how do you move when you're angry? Uh, you know, ask them to, ask them to share, uh, a situation where they were mad and, uh, how did they respond? How did they react? Uh, and then you can go right into the question of, like, what can we do when we're angry uh, to calm that down? Uh, uh, I've had to use, you know, the, the deep breathing myself at times when uh, situations arise and I don't respond too well and I need to calm down. Uh, so this is one of the uh, activities that we do uh, to help kids uh, identify and then be able to learn how to handle these emotions when they come. Another activity I've used for quite a long time, um, and again, it was when I first started using it, it was mainly just a fun, goofy little warm up before class would start, and it's called Bubbles. And uh, bubbles, the kids would simply be inside a predetermined size square or rectangle. And the object of the game was simply to move around without touching anyone. You're all bubbles. You know, what happens most of the time? What happens when two bubbles touch each other? And the kids understand, you know, most of the time they pop. Uh, once in a great while, you know, they'll join and it's really cool. But uh, typically uh, they pop. And so the objective of the game, again, is to avoid contact. Now, in today's world, the term bubble is taking on a different uh, connotation. Um, and so it'll be up to you if you want to try to address that or not. But in the past, uh, the bubble was basically a way to instruct kids uh, and introduce to them the concept of personal space and how you are to protect your own space while respecting other people's spaces. And so I had them do this little chant where they would hold their arms in front of them, like so, and they would say, protect, 
and then it would finish with respect and so hold their hands out so a sign of protecting themselves and then respecting those around them and so that's that was our little uh mantra that we would use at the beginning of the year as we would learn how to move around in general space we want to protect our own space while respecting the space of those around us so protect and respect and um, you know the whole reason that we want to uh, respect other people's spaces in the main is to uh, just show them the respect that we would like to be shown and it's also a, uh, a springboard into a conversation of uh, boundaries. Uh, there are people in our lives that we want to let in and there are other people uh, in our lives that they need to keep their distance and even more so now than ever uh, it's for health reasons, not just uh, respectful reasons, but health reasons, uh, there needs to be a certain distance. And so bubbles can be a way to help introduce uh, that concept uh, to kids who just don't understand why they can't be so close to somebody right now. So that that's, that's one way that they can uh, learn that concept. You know, a fun way to, at least in the past, uh, I could be a, a needle and so I would come into the situation and I would uh, be an extra um, reason for kids to avoid contact. And then they would not. So they're avoiding me while at the same time avoiding other people. Uh, another lesson that I stumbled across was uh, while watching my students participate in the activity called Upside Down from Open. Uh, it's part of their plug and play fitness module. And the objective of the activity is to help introduce the concept of pacing. So each group has six low profile cones. Uh, at times I use Frisbees as well. And the object is to get all of your items either facing up or down, depending on uh, what you decide that day. And there is a dice at the beginning of each group and each student takes a turn, they roll the dice and whatever number comes up, they must go to that object in line and, either, and flip it over until all of the objects are flipped up the exact same way. And then the first team to do so uh, can be the winner, or you can just go until everyone's done. It's completely up to you. Uh, what I noticed was, um, as, I, as I was watching the kids play, was that certain individuals, well, all individuals, would have uh, interesting ways that they either responded or reacted. And we got to have a little conversation afterwards. We got to see and talk about how some things just happen in life and basically how I respond is up to me. It's nobody. It's up to nobody else. I choose my responses. I choose what I do. And as you can see in some of the activities, uh, the the dice didn't roll exactly the way that the team wanted, and one they couldn't finish. And so it's just it just happened. So now, how do we respond? Do we do we blow up or do we just keep going? Uh, sometimes uh, it was somebody else's quote unquote fault, where we were about to win. And you rolled a one instead of a six, and so now we're two pieces away from winning. And so sometimes kids would, res would react that way. And then sometimes it's my fault where, oh, I did it. I'm so mad. I, I screwed it up for my team. Ah, rah, rah. You know, and then all kinds of grunts and groans and throwing a fit. And we have to move beyond that. We have to think about how we choose to react or respond. Randy Spring on Twitter introduced this game a little while back and uh, it has taken off. It is a, a great activity to teach manners. It's called Line Your Manners and you can uh, create a system on your floor or if you have lines, it's even better. The students just separate at the beginning and then they all travel the lines and you can have them just walk or jog or pick any kind of locomotor movement that you wish. And as they approach each other, they will stop, look at each other, and then do a rock, paper, scissor match. And then the winner turns to the person that they defeated, and they say, after you. And they allow that person to go. And then before that person goes, they say, thank you, and then they go. And so it is a, it's a beautiful way to practice and show good manners to each other. And uh, I loved it totally on its own, and so we started doing it. And as my kids were playing it, I started to notice that um, there was a chance to also teach gratitude and graciousness. 
Many students simply do not experience gratitude nor graciousness in their lives. We can show them that this is how it ought to be. Simply because someone won a contest doesn't mean they can't show grace and allow the other person to go ahead of them. This happens when children are lining up for lunch or at the drinking fountain or even at recess. Children can practice graciousness in so many ways. Conversely, these same students can practice gratitude. Whenever someone shows them grace, they respond with gratitude. This is how it can and should be. Most children just need opportunities to practice, and this activity gives both equal chances to do just that. And as you can see, I have some questions here available for you. You could ask, uh, as you as you break things down, how did it feel to the allow to allow the other person to pass before you? How did it feel when the other person let you go first? Uh, and then really great questions to ask as they leave. How can we show thankfulness to others today? And then how can we show kindness to somebody else today? They have chances outside of our class and always will to show gratitude and graciousness to people at lunch, recess, at home, in their neighborhoods, and just anywhere they go. Thank you for joining me today for Building Relationships Through Games. I hope that uh, the information here was helpful, useful, and encouraging to you. And I encourage you to look through your own activities that are uh, unique to your own situation and uh, things that you've already done to just dig through and investigate and see how can you teach other relational skills to your kids through the games that you already play. And if you have any questions, you could always contact me at hdphized at Twitter, and I'd be happy to have any conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you for watching this session from EPEW 2020. We're saving the next few minutes for you to ask those final questions before we log off. If you have any questions afterwards, please reach out to the presenter or send a message to EPEW through our website. Don't forget that we have more amazing sessions going on. Head over to our website, epew-cp.weebly.com and look for the virtual EPEW 2020 tab. You can also access the presentations on YouTube by typing in the hashtag EPEW 2020. We'd like to thank the amazing EPEW committee for all their hard work over this past year. This event would not have been possible without their dedication, commitment, and volunteering their time to providing high-quality professional development. Don't forget about our other events like our socials and share times. Links can be found on our website. Remember our motto for EPEW, come to learn, leave as family. Thank you for joining our family today.